Never Trust a Zombie, Chapter 9. You're not alone anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. Flying right through this book. 19 chapters, so we're uh, just about almost at a halfway point. Right around that point. Anyway, all right, here we go. My face is whatever. Ready? I am. Okay. I decide to avoid classmates and secure a few minutes alone for thinking, so I leave school for lunch. Uns unsure of whether or not I will run into anyone at the places in town, I go home. I tell mom I forgot my wallet, so I had to come home to get it, and once here I figure I'll just stay to eat. Mom thinks it's great having me come home for lunch. She's disappointed, however, that I don't have Rachel with me. I try to play it cool and just shrug in response. When I get back to school, it is only a few minutes before the next class. So I head on in and sit down. Rachel comes in shortly after and I ask about her reading. She says it was fine and then says nothing more. We walk to our next class together and she asks about my lunch. I give her a report and soon we are in the next class ready to begin. When the last bell rings, we stop first at her locker and then proceed to my car. She calls her mom to tell her that she'll be home by six. This is what I overhear. <laughs> I'm starting to laugh because I think I remember a part coming up that is funny to me. I don't know if it is or not. All right, so I just look foolish. Not foolish, just fun. Whatever. Hey, should I start over? Nah, just keep going. This is what I overhear. Hi, Mom. I'm going out for a bit. I'll be home by 6, though. Yeah, Eric, the one you met yesterday. Yes, again. She looks over at me and smiles. I don't know. We were going to get a milkshake if we could find anywhere in town to get one. Yes. Yeah, I know. Okay. I know. I'll be home at 6. Bye. Bye, Mom. And she hangs up. I can only assume the last part of the conversation was about Frank. That is, I can only assume until I ask her, did she mention Frank? Did she mention Frank? Rachel looks back at me with a serious face. Yep. He told her that you and I were too close for our own good this morning. They must have different standards where he's from. I didn't think we were close enough. I can't believe I just said that out loud. You do, do you? Well, don't go telling my mom. She wouldn't want to hear it. Rachel sighs. Yesterday, you told me Frank and the other guy don't leave the house. What was he doing going for a walk? I ask. Spying. That's my guess. He must have started walking shortly after I left. He seemed to be coming from the opposite direction when we saw him. <clears throat> he probably walked right by while I was reading and then stopped and watched from somewhere. <coughs> Mom didn't say he had been out. He'd been sent out to spy, <clears throat> but after last night, I think that's what's going on. Let's start driving. I'll tell you about it. I was going to ask, but now I don't have to. You indicated it might be difficult to find a milkshake around here? Yeah, they have slushies at the market, but I don't think anyone does milkshakes. There are some places to get ice cream cones, but I don't think any of them do milkshakes. A whole town without milkshakes? That doesn't seem possible. Really, I'm having a hard time believing this. Strangely, a harder time than I'm having believing I'm speaking with a zombie. It's funny how the teenage mind works. Just go to Maine and turn left. We can drive for a while if that's all right with you, I mean, she says. Yeah, fine by me. I've got some questions, and I think we should just talk for a while anyway. Okay. I start the car and the stereo blares to life. It's interesting how loud the stereo is when you first start the car compared to when you turn the car off. We both jump a little in our seats and as the loud volume startles us, as the loud volume startles us, but I quickly recover and adjust the knob to an appropriate background level of sound. Rachel clears her throat and then asks, is this the radio? No, MP3 files from a thumb drive, I say. This book takes place in 2013. Uh, oh, she says, with a tickle in her voice that makes me think she's getting ready to tease me. I didn't have you pegged as an enthusiast of jilted teenage girl rock music. There it is. I reach over and press the next button to skip away from Avril Lavigne's Everything Back But You. All right, to be fair to my mom, I also like to listen to Avril Lavigne. I explain to Rachel, I like anything with a steady beat and solid guitar. Mm-hmm. We drive for a bit. The next band to come up is The Graduate, a rock group from Illinois that I picked up on at my last school. I saw them play once. Hopefully this will restore music credibility for me in Rachel's eyes. This song is called Justified by a band called The Graduate. What do you think? I ask. Rachel turns the volume back up a bit and listens. Sounds pretty good. I don't care if you listen to Avril Lavigne. It just wasn't what I expected to be blasting from your stereo. There are many sides and shades to Eric Sterling. We can do without third-person narratives, Rachel says. Fair enough. We drive along, making a left onto Maine, listening to the music. Rachel seems to be looking around a lot. I wonder if she's looking for spies. I turn the volume down again and break our conversational silence. So what happened last night that makes you think your mom has sent spies out after you? Or was it just that you came over to my house? Not just that, but partly. Mom was concerned that I was already spending time alone with you after having only met you the day before. 
she's always concerned that the CDC is going to come after us and focus on me as the weakest link. Also, I'm not so sure that mom sent Frank out. This just keeps getting better and better. What do you mean, come after you? And if Frank wasn't sent out, then how does that factor in? I ask. Okay, that's a two-parter. First of all, when they figured out what happened to us, they immediately set to work on finding a cure for the virus, unsure of whether or not it would kill us or if they'd be able to resuscitate us once the virus was dead. At least that's what they told us they were working on. Mom was under the suspicion that they were actually studying us and trying to determine if it was possible to live a regular life under the effect of the virus. Mom thinks they want to use the virus as a way to enhance life for everyone. After they studied us for a while, she thinks they found that being a reanimate wasn't so bad. Mom started asking questions and trying to get involved with the research, but they wouldn't let her. Finally, they suggested we leave Atlanta and set up life somewhere else. That's how we ended up here. They gave us a story about finding a cure for the virus and getting things back to normal. Mom didn't think it would be possible, but she hoped for it. Frank and Mark were included in, in the initial research when Mom wasn't. She thinks they are supportive of the plan to use the virus to infect the general population, thinking they'd be doing everyone a favor. She thinks they might have pushed the idea. Frank and Mark didn't seem to be all too concerned with be becoming zombies. One time, Mom even suggested that they were behind the accident in the first place. I don't think Mom is worried that I'll turn, turn you into a zombie, but I think she is worried that Frank thinks you're a spy. Me? A government agent? Cool. I'm not a secret agent, although I think that would be pretty rad, I said. I know you aren't. Hmm. I know you aren't, otherwise I wouldn't have told you all about, about all of this. The point of sending a spy out here would be to see if we had revealed the secret to anyone. Everyone's greatest fear has been that I'd tell the world or infect the world, Rachel explains. If they want to infect the world, then why would they be? Why would that be a concern for them, I ask. Well, we've been like this for over two years, which is forever in my life. But for scientists, that's not very long at all. Frank and Mark think the changes have been great, but the folks at the CDC, at least the group responsible for all of this in the virology department, haven't experienced the changes themselves and are still uncertain. The fact is, no one knows the long-term effect. Does the virus have a limited lifespan, or is it constantly replicating itself, essentially restaffing the operating team that now controls my body? The thing I don't like to th really think about, but have to realize, is that I'm not really myself. I am mostly because the virus operates my brain and doesn't seem to have a consciousness of its own, but I don't feel the same as I did before. I'm hollow now. Rachel seems to be making herself small, physically compressing as she contemplates what she is describing as an empty existence. She hunches forward in the seat, hands clasped on her lap. Her hair is hanging down so as to cover her face. Wow. That's all I can think to say as I contemplate the weight of what she is considering, the loss of some part of herself, and not only the loss, but the awareness that something is missing. Neither of us speaks for a few minutes. We pass a lot of desert as we make our way north on Route 33. Rachel breaks the silence. Mom is worried that one of these days, the agency, that's how we, we refer to them at home. I've been calling them the CDC for your benefit, but it really isn't the CDC. It's just one agency, one department of it that is controlling this. We don't know how far up the chain of command any awareness of the situation goes. Anyway, Mom thinks the agency will eventually decide we need to be silenced for good. Some leadership change or something that the agency will lead to them needing to cover us up. Either that or they'll determine that there's too much risk and not enough benefit to this virus and they'll cancel the program. Mom expects that, they'll, that we'll either have agents come looking for us or Frank will do something. No matter where the threat comes from, she expects that they're keeping tabs on us and making sure we keep the secret. That's why me spending time alone with you is frightening. There's the risk that I'll tell you about all of this and as it turns out, that fear was justified. But there is also the risk that I could infect you. Granted, that chance is not very high. If it, was, if it was, they never would have let me go to high school, she says. Given my penchant for conspiracies, I'm eating this up with a spoon and finding it exhilarating. Maybe the risk of infection is still high, and they let you go to school because even if you do infect everyone, they can probably contain it easily enough. You know, just wipe out everyone. From my periphery, I see Rachel's head swing up, and she looks at me. I look over, and she looks horrified. Sorry, I get into conspiracies. No, you're probably right. I never thought about it that way. I always figured a small town would be easier to contain information-wise by keeping the story quiet, not by killing everyone. Now I did it. She's going to worry more than, than she was already. I try to be reassuring. Look, you aren't going to infect me, and I'm not going to tell anyone about this. So as long as we can pass by Frank and your mom, then everything's cool. Unless the CDC does send someone to eliminate us one day, she says. Well, yeah, I guess there's that. But if they haven't done it yet, why would they? Have you felt like you have been deteriorating over the last few years? If they are waiting us out to see if you end up turning into the fictional zombie monsters we see on TV and you haven't yet, then you should be safe. Unless someone with different ethics gets involved at the agency and they decide that needs, this needs to be ended, she says. But some, someone with different ethics might not justify killing five people, I interject. Five people who are already dead? It's not the same thing. A perfectly ethical scientist may see us as viruses, potentially dangerous viruses, epidemic level of danger, pandemic even. 
The clear choice would be to kill the virus in the interest of humanity. It would have been done already if we hadn't, re if we hadn't retained so much of our personalities. And because we retained whatever portion of our personalities that we have is why I haven't tried to kill myself. And I think that's the case for all five of us remaining from the original infection event. Is there any evidence to suggest this might be happening in the near future? The extermination, I mean? My dad has had a few new men come to work for him. Mom swears they are part of the agency. When she brought up her concern, Frank dismissed her worries and explained that we are all still in the good graces of the agency and the work he and Mark are doing is very valuable. That was when Mom started worrying about Frank's agenda and allegiance. Have you caught Frank associating with those new guys? I ask. No, I never see anyone do anything around here, around there. Mom says she can spot agency people anywhere, and she doesn't like the air of superiority that Frank has raised lately. I guess I don't see where the agency really has to worry. What? I don't. I guess I don't see where the agency really has to worry about all of you. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. What would happen if you told someone? They didn't do anything wrong. It'd just be reported that there was an accident with the virus, and then for the last two years, the situation has been monitored and everything is fine. I say. Rachel says, everything is fine? I know what you're trying to say, but we are zombies, remember? I know, but you aren't killing people and eating their brains. We aren't too far from town, but far enough that there aren't any other people around. There's a pull-off spot on the road, and I park in it. Want to sit outside and talk here? I ask before cutting the engine. Sure. We get out, and I realize that this far from any houses, there isn't any irrigation, so the ground is just dirt, rocks, and sharp plants. I've never understood why all desert plants are so sharp. What is it about being dry that makes them spear-like? Anyway, there's no grass for sitting on. I hop onto the hood of the car and lie against, lie back against the windshield. Rachel follows my lead. I shimmy a little closer to her, and then she reciprocates with a shimmy of her own, and we are lying shoulder to shoulder. For a minute or two, we take in the vast nothingness before us and absorb some winter sun. We also absorb some engine heat through the car's hood. It's not altogether unpleasant. She, pick up, she picks up the conversation where we left off. None of us ever killed anyone, but it wasn't for lack of desire. I let that statement sit for a bit. Is she telling me that she wanted to kill someone? Understandably, I guess. I might have wanted to kill someone if they just told me their top secret project resulted in the death and reanimation of my family. Are you saying that you wanted to kill someone because they turned you into a zombie? I ask. No, I'm saying that when I was first a zombie, the craving for brain matter was slowly building up in me. They didn't realize right away that brains were what we needed to eat. So for the first few days, we seemed like we were dying again. No brains makes us weak, remember? So we were all getting weak and sickly. Meanwhile, each of us had a new desire to eat brains. None of us had ever eaten brain before, and it was several days before Mark had the guts to mention that he had the cravings, and then we all confessed to having the same hankering. Good word choice. I love that word, hankering. What? Yeah, it's okay. Rachel smiles and rolls her eyes as she shakes her head at me. Anyway, we all wanted to eat brain. It made sense, though, because brain eating was a behavior observed in the lizards where the virus was originally found. That makes sense, I say. Those first days and even weeks were really confusing for everyone. The agency started working on a plan for obtaining human brains, ones that didn't die from disease and weren't slaughtered for our meal, which meant accident victims. It would be possible for them to get the brains in the name of research, but it wasn't as easy as going to McDonald's or something. We kept getting weaker, and as the cravings for brains intensified, Mark admitted that he wanted to kill someone and eat their brain. Not only that he wanted to, but he was going to if they didn't provide any other way to feed the craving. That freaked everyone out and none of the rest of us joined in this confession. But since I'm telling you everything anyway, I did have that same feeling. I wanted to kill someone. Luckily, I was so weak then that I couldn't. When they brought us brains to eat, we all started getting better. It wasn't until we were feeling better that some of us realized we ate the brain of another human being, and we labeled ourselves monsters. I made the connection then with movie zombies and threw out their reanimate label. Frank didn't seem to have a problem with eating brain. It was scientific. Mom put on a show of being all right with it, but I don't think she was. They started doing tests and whatnot and determined pretty quickly that animal brains ought to be sufficient. We tried several different species, not really a whole lot of difference among them. We settled on cow brain for the availability of it. That was the key that linked us to the slaughterhouse here. We've been on cow brain ever since, but the potential to, de the potential to degenerate into the brain craving monster has never been so far out of the realm of possibility that we haven't felt the need to be cautious. So to answer your question, that's why the agency doesn't want this getting out. Not until they can figure out how to cure the virus without killing us for good or until they can figure out how to keep people well-fed and not monster-like. I'm afraid Frank doesn't see it as monster-like, and he wants to live freely now, embracing his new nature. Rachel props herself up on one elbow, on her elbow and faces me. But you just said you don't see Frank much, so why do you think he feels this way, I say. Because last night, he said, I am not a monster. This is my new nature. I want to embrace it. And he waved his fist in the air like this. Rachel waves her fist around like a frustrated old scientist emphasizing his point. Well, that will do it, I state the obvious. Yeah. After you dropped me off last night, I went into the den and found Mom, Dad, Mark, and Frank having a discussion. 
When I walked in, they all looked at me, very solemn expressions. I apologized for interrupting and turned to leave, but Frank called me back and asked, where have you been? Which I thought was odd coming from him instead of my parents, Rachel says. Yeah, did you tell him you, who, did you tell him you were with me? I ask. No, I told him I was out, and then mom said I was with a new friend from school, to which Frank seemed to get concerned and started asking questions about you, like where you're from and stuff. Apparently, they had been talking about the new guys at work with Dad, and they had generated the idea that there were spies coming to make sure we haven't let out the secret. Frank assumed they'd send someone to the school to check on me since I'm the only one they trust, the, since I'm the one they trust the least. Obviously, with you just moving in, you fit the profile, she says. Makes sense. Do they want to meet me? To try to, figure, to try to find out? I ask. Frank said I should invite you over right away, but Mom and Dad were against that. They've been against my having any friends over ever. They're afraid of infecting anyone, at least as much as they're afraid of me telling anyone the secret. They know they can't stop me from that, though, since they can't spend every minute of every day with me. They do trust me with the secret, but are worried about infecting others. I've never understood why... Uh, looked up. <laughs> I've never understood why they think me going to school is okay, but having people over is not. Besides, I've already done high school. I was 17 when I reanimated, so I'll be 17 forever, essentially. I was almost through senior year. They had me come here as a sophomore to buy some time before dealing with the idea of me going to college or something. I hadn't thought about that. You said your cells don't really change, so you don't age. You're 19 then in normal years? I'm dating a college girl almost. That's rad. Yes. Well, you don't look a day over 17, I say. Rachel slides off her elbow to rest on her back again. Yep. Thanks. Some clouds pass by overhead, and we watch them in silence. What's the plan then, I ask? For what? For us. Should I come to your house and meet everyone so they can determine if I'm a threat or not? What's the alternative? Let them worry and try to stop you and I from seeing each other? I've read Romeo and Juliet. I've seen West Side Story. That path never ends well. I don't like the wait-and-see plan. Well, I'm already dead, but maybe we shouldn't hang out. I have the potential to give you a virus that can kill you and turn you into a monster. I have the potential to kill you and eat your brain if I turn into a monster. I shouldn't have befriended you. I really shouldn't have told you any of this. It was selfish of me. Rachel sits up and slides off the car. Unsure of what I am hearing from her, I stay put and wait to see where she is go where she is going to go. Where she is going to go. <laughs> Which turns out to be the desert. She's walking away from the car on the road. Rachel, where are you going? I shout. Away. I'm just going to go away. She yells without turning around. I jump off the car and run to catch up with her. You can't just walk away from me like that. I know the secret. You aren't alone in this anymore. You aren't going to give me the virus. If it was that dangerous, they wouldn't let you go to school. And I'm pretty sure you can't kill me, even if you were craving my sweet brain. You said you'd be all weak and stuff if it got to that point anyway. As I come up next to Rachel, I suddenly find myself lying face down in the dirt with my arms folded behind me and Rachel kneeling on my back. You can't take me. I'm not super strong, but my body is strong enough, stronger than I ever was before. And though I may become weak if I'm hungry for brains, the weakness is more of a lethargic thing, not a strength thing. That first week after transitioning, it was both, but now it's more of a lethargic thing. I'd be, I'd be slow, but I could still overpower you. Having made her point, Rachel stands up and helps me to my feet. She brushes the dirt from my shirt and apologizes. No problem. The example was much more effective than just telling me. I probably wouldn't have really believed you anyway. Now I do, I say. Only my ego is bruised. Well, that and possibly my spleen. We do pose a threat, and I think maybe the agency is growing weary of that. Weary of that. I think they have determined that they can't reverse this thing, and it's either write us off as a failed experiment or risk an outbreak. I don't think they want the outbreak. Frank, on the other hand, might want the outbreak, or at any rate, he doesn't want to be written off, which in this case means executed. Rachel explains. I assume that's what you meant, I said. Yeah, I ask. So do you think Frank will try to write the rest of you off and get out of town before the agency shows up? Will it be doctors in lab coats or military assassins? What? When the agency comes for you, I clarify. Who knows? They might try to stage it to look like an accident, burn the house down or something. Maybe they'll tell us they made a breakthrough and fly us back to Atlanta, and then once they have us in the lab, they'll make their move then. That's how my mom thinks it will happen. The agency has a team for handling things like this, all top secret, Rachel says. What does your dad think about all of this? You haven't mentioned him much at all. Dad is quiet most of the time. He handles the business stuff that he needs to in order to maintain the cover story, but otherwise he doesn't say much in regards to our condition. He used to work for the... He had an exciting job, and I think he misses it. That's too bad, I say. I noticed she stopped herself before saying where her dad used to work. That's curious, but I'll save it for later. I don't think now is the time to pry into things. She's being so forthright with everything, I'll let her decide what is best to discuss right now. I go on. So what do we do? If the agency is going to come kill you all, can we stop that? If Frank is going to kill you all, can we stop that? 
I'm not excited about either of those possibilities, especially if in either scenario I end up dead as well. See, I never should have brought you into this. Now you're at risk. I was just so tired of being alone and thought that being an outsider to this place, you and I would be able to connect easily. And we did. We have. And I'm glad. But now I feel bad about putting you in danger. Well, what's done is done. I try to be reassuring, but come across as simply fatalistic. I don't know how to get you out of this danger unless... Rachel turns back toward the car. Unless what? I ask, my curiosity peaking. Unless we make you a zombie too, she says. My curiosity vanishes. Well, from what you've described so far, I don't think it's all that unappealing. But just the same, I guess I prefer to stay living. No offense, I explain. None taken. It's not like I'm asking you to just change religions or something. I'm asking you to, you to die. Well, when you put it that way, the trail off for effect. How would that help, anyway? I don't see the connection. Would Frank be less insane if more people were zombies? Would the agency just want to eliminate me as well in that scenario? I guess so. But then I wouldn't have to be worried about keeping it secret that I told you the secret. Because you'd be one of us, Rachel says. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense, really, when you really consider things. I say and pat her on the shoulder. Careful with the condescending mannerisms, buddy, or I'll turn you into a zombie. Rachel's threat sounds flat and defeated. I take it as a sign she would change the conversation. <clears throat> I take it as a sign that we should change the conversation in the venue. No one wants to dwell on the subject of their murder and transformation into a brainy new monster. How about we head back into town? We can get slushies instead of milkshakes. Maybe on Saturday we can head out of town and find a real milkshake vendor, I offer. All right, let's get slushies. I don't think my parents would let me go out of town with you. Not until they figure out whether or not you're with the agency. Maybe I can talk them into letting you come over for dinner before then. Since we don't eat dinner in a traditional manner, it might take some work to put on that type of show. And they'll want to do things traditionally so as not to arouse your suspicions. If they only knew I have no suspicions. If only, she says as she shakes my hand in hers. I'm sorry I brought <clears throat> I'm sorry I brought you into this. I'm sorry I was interested in you. If I just would have ignored you and Jim the other day, none of this would have happened. But I didn't ignore you. And if I didn't tell you this, then you'd think the same things that Trent and the rest think about me. I just didn't want to have that happen all over again. I wish things were different. I really do. You wish you were alive like the other girls? I ask, holding my sarcasm will cheer her up a bit. That or I wish you were dead. I could go either way at this point. She takes the bait. We walk back to the car, hand in hand, trying not to stir up too much of a dust storm in the dry air. I hear a motor and look down the road towards town. There's a car coming, fast. It starts to slow as it gets closer. Rachel gasps and drops, drops my hand when she sees it. What is it? Or who is it? I ask. She looks terrified, but only for a moment. It's one of our cars. I think it's Frank, she says as the car pulls up alongside mine. We are still walking when the car stops and the passenger window goes down. We stop on the passenger side of my car. Looking over the hood and through the open window of the other car, I find myself staring into the bifocal covered eyes from earlier today. It is Frank, and he isn't smiling. Ah, Rachel and Eric, is it? He says. Yes, Eric, I confirm. Hi, Frank. I pretend like I'm struggling to recall his name, although I, of course, know his name just as well as he knows mine. But since he pretended, I figure I should pretend as well. I saw the car stop and wondered if the driver was in need of assistance. I didn't expect to find the two of you. From the inflection in his voice, it sounds like the surprise isn't so much that it is us, but that it is the two of us together. Rachel says, Where are you headed, Frank? You don't usually get out of town much. She's on the offensive. Her face looks afraid, but her voice remains steady. Another result of low blood flow, I assume. The fight-or-flight response doesn't lead to constricted vocal cords. Another side effect, it isn't so bad, at least not on the surface. Well, I thought I saw a stranded motorist who may need may have needed my assistance, he says calmly, and slowly drifts his gaze from me to Rachel. I notice he didn't answer the question. But how did you know there might have been a stranded motorist out here? Rachel isn't pulling any punches. I was just out for a drive, Rachel. What were the two of you doing out here in the desert? I noticed you two were walking back to the car. Frank is taking on the challenge. I try to derail the battle that seems to be starting. I'm having a difficult time adjusting to Cranston, specifically the summer weather What? The summer weather during what should be winter. We stopped so I could, talk, so I could walk around and Rachel could be my talk therapist. Maybe I can convince Frank that I'm not a special agent intent on eliminating him. My family just moved here from Chicago last week. It's quite the culture shock. Chicago, eh? You don't say. Yes, I can imagine that's a shift in lifestyle, Frank says. Well, we are headed back to town now, so I guess I'll see you later, Frank. Rachel, mostly hidden from Frank's view by my car, nudges me with her elbow. I take the hint. Right. Thanks for stopping to check on us, Frank, but we are fine. I hope you have a nice drive. I open Rachel's door for her and wait for her to get into the car before closing it. She doesn't say anything else to Frank. Yes, I expect it will be very nice. You two behave yourselves now. Frank gives me a cold, hard look and then smiles slightly. I nod to Frank and walk around the back of the car to the driver's side. His car continues to idle in place until I am in the driver's seat. Finally, I look up at him, and he, he looks forward and drives off slowly. I start the car, look over my shoulder, and pull the U-turn to head back to town. 
Texas is pretty flat, and this road is straight, so it was a good while before Frank's car is barely visible in my rearview mirror. Just as I'm about to lose sight of him, I think his brake lights come on. What do you make of that? I asked Rachel. I don't know. He really hasn't left town in a really long time. I suppose he was trying to find me, to find us. The only question, then, is whether he took it upon himself to do so or if he is working in conjunction with the agency. If not for Mom's suspicions of Frank, I would have thought she sent him out to spy on us. But I'm pretty sure she is now more suspicious of Frank than she is of me. But unless he was there with your mom when you called her, or she told him afterwards, he wouldn't have known you weren't home or weren't coming home right away, I suggest. Good point. So my mom is involved somehow. Maybe Frank is making his move, whatever that is going to be. He's trying to track me down to get us all at the same time. Maybe I should go home now, Rachel says. Bring me with you. I'm in this now. Maybe whatever it is Frank wants to do, we can divert it by telling everyone that I know about this stuff. That's got to change his plans, even if it's just to add me to his hit list. Rachel looks at me with an intensity I don't think I've ever experienced before. Thankfully, I don't have to experience the fullness of it as I'm trying to keep my eyes on the road. You're right, Eric. Let's tell them I told you and see what happens. At least it should bring Frank's agenda out into the open and we can deal with it. Besides, we aren't monsters. We just have a different diet and a deadly virus. Why shouldn't we get to live normal lives? Right, I agree. I guess the worst that can happen is that we'll all die. They'll kill you to keep you quiet, and they'll kill me for telling, which will mean my parents will likely be killed also, because they wouldn't let anyone kill me for that. But I've already died once, so I'm not really concerned about that. Of course, it might not be on top of your list of things to do in the near future. I live life on the edge, one day at a time, come what may. What am I saying? I don't want to die tonight. You, sir, are either brave or stupid, Rachel says with a smile. I like it. I reach over to, I reach over to hold her hand, and she lets me. We drive the next few miles to her house in silence. Maybe we should have come up with a plan for breaking the news, but instead we just enjoyed the silence. That's chapter nine. I highly recommend that everybody write a book and then wait 10 years and then read it and like remember all the little things you add in. that are like specific elements of life that experiences you've had that you put in there in the, in the, in the, in the fiction. Um, but it's like, there's so many little, moments that are uh that lead me to recall experiences i've had that i put into the storyline it's fun okay so that's chapter nine chapter 10 suburban home next time and uh yeah all right well thanks for listening bye